Well, I, I actually meet quite a few people here and that email me and so forth. They kind of go out in the woods and wander around. They have no idea how to get started. How would you get people started? Well, the first thing you got to do is you got to have the right equipment. So if you're going to go out in the woods, you know, a lot of times you want to have some boots, you know, a pair of pants, something, you know, ticks, there's bugs. I wear these army pants because you can tighten them, you know, waterproof boots, your bag. Um, you want to have a nice mesh bag or a basket or some kind of breathable material because morels have enzymes in them. So if you're lucky enough to find one, you don't want your catch getting destroyed before you get it home. So proper equipment. So basically what I tell them is then you go out and you kind of look at, you know, is the signs right? Are there dandelions in the yard? Are the may apples up? Are there lilacs blooming? If all that's going on, you're going to go out. And first I'd tell them, one of the two best trees in, in most of the United States is an elm and a cottonwood. And a lot of people associate morels with elm because of the Dutch elm disease that went through in the mid-60s and 70s and killed thousands of trees, millions. What it happens is, if you can find a dead elm or dead cottonwood, you usually find really large flushes of morels. And what that is, is that morels saff is becoming a saffirite and it's finishing off that tree. That's its food source. It went from the symbiotic relationship. And that's the other way you're going to find morels is if you think about symbiotic. Well, they live with ash trees. They live with cottonwoods. They live with the elm because we know we find them on them. They also live on tulip poplars and any kind of poplar like aspen. Actually, aspen and cottonwood are in the same family. And I've kind of learned that a lot of trees in the same family or genus or species, morels follow those depending, you know, from southern states up to northern states. They may be a different tree, but they're in the same family. So... Basically, once you learn your trees and, you know, and once you find a spot, keep going back to that spot because the morel organism's in the ground there. It actually lives in the ground. It's, that mushroom is just its reproductive organ. So something made it fruit. So we know that a tree died or the tree's damaged or something got disturbed. If there's a bulldozer, you know, you see where somebody ran a bulldozer, the morel gets hurt, it's going to fix that. So the opportunity thing is... Dead trees, you're going to look in forest, and you want really kind of open areas. The more ground clutter you have, the harder it is for sunlight to get in. So morels need sunlight and humidity. So basically, what I'm saying is, if it's sunny, been warm, the rain's there, and all those factors are in, you start going out in the woods, and you look for an ash tree. Like, there's a huge ash tree over that way that's standing right there. I would walk up to that tree and look around the base of it. And how do you know, what's the, is that the one with the white spot That's on it? That's the one with the white spot, and it kind of looks like an alligator mark. And I kind of differentiate that tree. And so when I'm out in the woods, I'm going, that looks like an ash tree. Well, that looks like an ash tree. That looks like, so I get my line, and I hit that tree, that tree, and that tree. And then I'm like, wow, there's a sycamore, and there's an elm. I'm going to go to that tree and that tree. So by hunting more trees, you increase your odds. That's how I became the Mushroom King, was actually, I learned that it was all about trees. So... I started hunting. If I knew it was on ash trees, well, then I started finding as many ash trees as I could. And I literally, I kiss trees. It's like, mm, I love you. You know, it's like, how you doing? I haven't seen you for a year. Every spring. And I have the same, I'd say 10,000 trees in a couple parks that I know personally that that's my little route. And there's mushrooms on them every year. You know, one thing that I sort of thought about when I was following my dad that I hadn't thought about before, it's almost a little bit like being a fisherman in that you have your favorite spots. And you hit your favorite spots, and you keep your eyes open for maybe new promising spots. New promising spots. And that's another thing that I explain to people. It's like, okay, if you can just imagine ten trees, and on every tree that morel's living. Well, you come over here this one year, and that tree was dead, and you found mushrooms on it for that year. And you walked all the rest of them and didn't find any. Well, the next year you went over there, and there wasn't as many, but you walked over here, and there's ten mushrooms on this tree. So you got to keep continually looking, like you said, you follow around... And somebody, and the funny thing you said fishing is somebody's like, why do you call it mushroom hunting? And I'm like, well, you know, they don't call it fish catching, do they? Because you don't just go out and catch a fish every time. You don't go out deer catching, do you? Or, because you don't every time go out and get a deer. You don't always go out mushroom hunting and find a mushroom. It takes, you have to hunt the trees, you have to hunt the terrain, and you have to hunt the mushrooms. So I mean, substitute the word treasure for mushroom. Right, exactly. Treasure so it is, it's, it is a little treasure hunt. It's actually, I call it Easter, Easter egg hunting for adults sometimes. You know, it's like, yay, we can all go out and Easter egg hunt. And, and it really is, it's exciting to me. You know, I can't wait to, you know, I pick my first one and then I'm sad when I pick my last one.